Hello, everyone. I am Ellen Magali. I am the executive editor at Veranda. And um, I feel like if I could see you all, I would see so many familiar faces, which would be lovely. But this is such a great opportunity. And I want to thank um, Discover ADAC for um, getting this together virtually because it's been a minute. It's been a minute since we've all been together. And um, we all trade in ideas. And um, this is so necessary and um, inspiring to be able to um, talk to the leaders in the field and really hear what they're doing right now and some of their perspectives. So I want to thank Discover ADAC for this. Um, it's really been, and the silver lining too is that um, I'm, we might be saying good morning actually to some of those on the West Coast um, joining us. I think we're going to have a pretty geographically diverse audience. Um, and I want to thank Made Goods, um, who is sponsoring um, today's panel. And um, a good reminder that the showrooms are open and um, the fall collections are out. So be sure and um, get into those showrooms, see what's going on out there. And, um, and just, you know, that's one thing that hasn't changed is you can go in and you can see what's new. And um, I, there's, we're going to get a little peek of it before, uh, before the panel's over. So. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about state of the arts. Um, this came about end of last year because, you know, every issue for us, Steele and I were talking, was, is, is an education. You know, it's an education on different artists, on different sources, on um, the role of decorating, and also the building of de decorators working with existing collections or trying to build collections. It's an education for us e each time. And so we thought, you know, what a, what a wealth of things we could talk about. What we didn't, I don't think, know at the time, we certainly didn't know, was how well-timed this would be. Um, it's not so much of a spoiler to say that, you know, in, in our next issue, I, I was just reading a quote from a very wise woman who was talking about how some of the most important pieces of art in history have been made during very challenging, challenging times. And it's a, that way of um, the artist bringing beauty in and um, you know, sort of needing beauty in the world. And I think that's probably what you're hearing from your clients. And, um, and what a, so what a great time to talk about this. So today we're gonna to be talking about the role of fine art in decorating. We're gonna be talking about building great collections. And um, we're gonna be talking about just sort of the, um, the importance of relationships between dealers and designers. And, but m what we're gonna get most of is the wonderfully inspiring insights from three masters, and I couldn't um, be more delighted to introduce them to you um, because each time I talk to them is also um, an education. And the best way I can say collectively is it's, these are the people you want to sit next to at a dinner party. They're going to take you away with their stories. They just have this breadth of knowledge that is absolutely wonderful. And so enough preamble. I will get right into um, int introducing them um, so that we can start to hear them talk. Um, that we're going to start with the first, um, a giant of design, Alex Papa Christidis. Um, he has been in the, de the decorating world for more than 30 years and has graced the pages of every decorating magazine that you've all loved and cherished. And um, I would say that um, he also has a book, Are the Art of uh, Elegance. And um, I would say the veranda readers are particularly familiar with Alex. Um, you may remember this. This is the um, his Kips Bay uh, dining room that was on the cover of, I believe it was 2017. It was about three years ago or so, and then um, just just absolutely gorgeous. And but I got to know Alex when we published this very special project in the Hamptons. This was in our May June issue, and um, it was sort of this glimmering wonderland of gilded furniture and finishes and surfaces and all of these um, wonderfully original elements that is really, that, that's his trademark, is originality and sort of this sophisticated um, approach to uh, originality. So these are, um, so the, anyway, here's, here's some more of these images, but I wanted to um, say welcome, Alex, and say that also, you know, um, one of the reasons why this is so special is this is your sister's project. So I'm going to get a little assist from her on, on an introduction here. She said, 
she, you are, you are younger than your sister who decorate, who, Ophelia, who you decorate this for you. And she said, he has been our Beau Brummel um, in the family. He, she said he has helped every member of our family develop their own sense of style. Is this true? You know, it is, Ellen. And, and Ellen, thank you for having me here. And I, I love Veranda and ADAC, and it's so nice to be here. You know what? I try to put myself into my clients' shoes and understand how they live, how, how they like to decorate, how they use their house, how they want to, you know, their sense of color, their sense of style. Do they, are they classic? Are they contemporary? Are they, you know, do they want it casual? Do they have children? Do they have dogs? And, and so, you know, we're all different in my family. We're, we, there's a common thread, which is we're all family oriented. And then we all have different sensibilities and different tastes. And so it's great because it's fun for me because every house is different. And mm -hmm. I love that. And again, you know, when I, when I became a decorator, I realized the thing that I love so much about decorating is every time it's a unique experience. If it's, even if it's the same client, it's a different house. If it's their city apartment, it's different from their country house. So it's so fun for me because I try to approach it in, in, in a new way. You know, the light's different, the scale of the rooms are different, you know, the way they use it is different. And so I love that. And that's what's fun for me that I can, I can sort of have fun with it and with them and create something that is unique but reflective of who they are and how they want to live. And it, it, and it really speaks to um, how what's always struck me about your work is, is, again, the originality. So you look at every project as a new opportunity to do something different. And, um, and I think that's what's made it so remarkable. But let's put a pin in this, um, Alex, that at some point, and everybody at home, raise your hand if we, if we need to have a panel on decorating for family, because you know everybody out there has, um, has done it and, and probably does it often, even if it's just um, coming over for Christmas dinner and saying, where should I put this and what do I need there? So maybe that's a different panel altogether too, is decorating for family. <laughs> Well, you know what, it's such a, well, family, of course, is, is, is a very intense relationship and it's more intimate than any. And I'm very, very close to my family. But again, you become very close to your clients and your, mm -hmm. your, their houses become extensions of your own home. You know, I do everything from training their staff to setting the tables to, you know, I'm involved as, I'm in, as involved as you want me to be. I love being involved in the house and how it runs and how it works and how you use it. It's just fun for me. I mean, I, I love it. Yeah, well, and I think it also speaks to relationships are at the core of everything that you do. And I think that's a great segue to our next panelist as well, because um, you and Gerald have quite a relationship. Um, Gerald Bland is a, um, and Alex introduced me to Gerald actually, um, fine arts and antiques dealer in New York. And um, he's also been on the decorating scene for 30, you know, 30 plus years. But even before that was, um, he was the head, of, he, he ran the English furniture um, department at Sotheby's. And so has kind of come into this world of antiques and then kind of pivoted into also contemporary art. Um, say something to you, Alan, the great thing about Jerry is that he has, he has such a sophisticated point of view, which I love. Yeah. And he also, you know, he's very creative in what he does. And again, for me, you know, Jerry's one of the best dealers in New York. And I love that he actually makes things that feel timeless and interesting. And he has an understanding of antiques and mixing contemporary things with them in a yeah. way that just is so stylish and natural. Yeah. And so for me, he's a great go-to person when I'm buying something contemporary. And again, his pieces are unique, they're artisanal. So I'm not buying something from a showroom that you know somebody else is buying the exact same thing. And right. then I go you know, to somebody else's house and see exactly the same thing. Jerry's things are more unique and they're more couture for the project. And I love that. And I think that's what luxury is all about. It's about not having the same things everybody else has. Yeah, and you know, when I, you and I first talked about this panel too, um, basically this is, um, Alex said, call Gerald. <laughs> call Gerald, because we had talked about what we wanted to say in this. And, and so, you know, 
I should also mention too that um, Gerald's um, farmhouse in, um, in, in Tuscany was in our, I, I looked and I think it was, it was a few years ago. It was probably five to seven, yeah. something like that years ago. More like seven, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and anyway, so he has also been in Veranda and so we're so proud of that. And, um, and I just wanna thank you for being here, Gerald. I know that um, we've got a lot, of, a lot of questions for you. I hope that you, um, ate a good breakfast this morning. I hope that everybody is just, you know, there you go. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, and our third, um, sorry, I, I need to also show, this is, this is um, Gerald's Gallery in New York. You can find him at the Fine Arts Center on 59th Street. Um, so as you can see, it's this wonderful mix of antiques and contemporary art. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that really, about the role of contemporary art in his business, because I think it is a huge lesson in decorating itself. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through it. And, you know, this is from um, Alex's project. And I wanted to show you, this is one of the artists that um, Gerald represents. The chandelier is an Eve, Eve, Captain, Eve, Eve Kaplan piece. Yeah. Who um, again, you know, Eve is just, for me, one of, the most spectacular contemporary artisans out there today. I mean, I, I just, I can't get enough of Eve. And I love, again, so Jerry will tell you, but she was an 18th century furniture restorer who Jerry noticed a piece of ceramic in, his, in, her, in her shop and then commissioned her to make things. So there's a timelessness to what she creates because of her knowledge of the 18th century and 19th century that feels so classic and I don't think we'll ever date. No, they're, they're all takes on 18th century forms. Oh, uh, they are. Okay, okay. On 18th century forms, but with her contemporary interpretation. Amazing. Yeah. And and um, there was a, there were a few other pieces too in this house. I'm just going to show. And these are just also another example, you know, of of newer pieces. Um, this these are custom tables um, for also from Alex's project that he worked with um, Gerald on. For these are these just are they reflective? They're reflective. They're, they're steel. All aluminum. Okay. So I called Jerry and I said I need party tables for, <laughs> when, for when sister entertains. And you know what? In our own house, I have those typical skirted tables that I use, and I have like custom made tablecloths and ballroom chairs that are wood with velvet cushions. And so in this house, it didn't feel right. And sister wanted the ability to be able to entertain. So Jerry made these insane tables where the base and the top come apart. And they're just like, I, I mean, all I can say is chic from Chicville. I mean, they're just crazy good looking. And this is, a, this is, this is my sister, these are Ophelia's party tables. I mean, well, what gets better than that? No, but you know, when I'm talking about who I want to sit next to at a dinner party, I think I want to be sitting here with one of you, one of you into the evening. You know, and by the way, everybody, it is afternoon. So if you want to pour yourself a glass of something while we all talk about that, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. Um, welcome, Gerald. Um, yep. I'm going to now. So our third, um, our third panelist is Timothy Tu. And if we were all in Atlanta on that stage, he could just walk over from his gallery, uh, which is right near ADAC. Um, in the, it's the galleries at Peachtree Hills. And um, Timothy is a contemporary art gallerist, again, in Atlanta, whose entree into, um, into this world really was when he lived in Paris and had, was discovering artists that really piqued his interest and, and came back here and opened a gallery of his own and began bringing in not just artists from all over the country, but um, England and Germany and has really, um, and now represents um, some really beautiful names in art. Um, I'm gonna show you a few, this is his gallery, and I'm gonna show you a few pictures. This is a uh, Colombian American artist, America Martin, and um, Amy Donaldson, who, um, these are sort of abstracts that are kind of graffiti inspired. Um, yeah, and he also represents Hunt Slonim, Brian Rittenberg, Kathy Hegman, and Susan Dory. And um, welcome, Timothy. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. I hope I will not be competing against the dogs that are inside barking. And <laughs> Aren't we all, right? They may be making noise in a moment. So. Well, you, have to, you have to tell us where you are because I think you might be more on vacation than the rest of us are. I am at St. Simon's Island. So. Lovely. Lovely. 
it's a pretty day, so I'm outdoors. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I'm gonna, um, we're gonna go to just us now. Um, let's see, everybody still see us? Um, and we're gonna just get right into, right into the questions here. Um, and I think, you know, we'll start with Alex. You know, you encourage clients to collect furniture with the same sort of gusto and enthusiasm as they would collect art, art for their walls. And, um, you know, there's a relationship between fine art and fine furnishings that you believe is, is the core of good design. Um, why is this relationship so important? Well, look, I, I think it's, 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 there's a real story to this. And I think the story is that, you know, great art and great furniture was always used together. It was never separated. I mean, if, if you had a beautiful house, you had beautiful art and you had beautiful furniture. And then I think sort of maybe furniture got very expensive and antiques became very desirable. And then everybody tired of them at the same time and went to sell them and found that the prices that they had paid for antiques wasn't what they were getting back for them. And so antiques went out of fashion for a period. And art became so important because it was such a great investment and people felt that they you know, were making so much money in art and it became a commodity rather than a part of your house. And it also became a status symbol. To me, it's always been important to have a balance between furniture and art. And for me, everything you buy, you should love, whether it's a painting or a piece of furniture. It shouldn't be that you're buying because something is an investment. I don't believe in buying a house that's an investment. I believe in buying a house because you love it. And if it goes up in value, wonderful. And if it doesn't, who cares? I think that, you know, Things, homes, furniture, art are meant to be enjoyed, lived with, used, and loved. So again, so I think unfortunately antiques then sort of got a bad rap for a while. And now I believe they're coming back. You know, I was just, uh, the, the, the Parencio sale, which was a house decorated by Henri Samuel, uh, just, the, it just came up at Christie's and upholstered chairs by Henri Samuel and, and, and sofas were selling for $30,000 in somebody else's old fabric that hadn't been touched in 25 years. So clearly there's interest in these kinds of things and decorating again, which is great and makes us all happy. But I try to encourage clients that, you know, it's important to have a relationship between the art and the interiors. And so many of my clients collect art, but they're like, well, you know, I, I was with a client today and she said to me, she's living in this fabulous new contemporary building in New York in Manhattan where the apartments are, you know, very grand and quite expensive. And she said she goes to see other people's houses in the building. They have incredible art and crate and barrel furniture, which mm -hmm. to me is just absolutely no. Like, <laughs> how do you have incredible art and cheap furniture made in China? And it's not even that cheap. So it's very important that there is a relationship to everything that you buy. Yeah. And that it's all has a standard and a quality level. It's yeah. very important. And I teach and encourage and sometimes beg clients to understand that. It's very important to me and to a well-rounded interior. Right. It's not just there's an investment on the walls and it has no relation to what, what's around, what you're sitting on, what you're that makes a lot, I mean that that makes a lot of sense. And you know, um, Timothy and as they're a yeah. great contemporary furniture designers and they're great right. contemporary things. And there's also wonderful 20th century designers, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, tons of them, Gabriella Crespi, Maria Pergay, you know, tons and tons of people who made beautiful furniture throughout, you know, the seventies, the eighties, mm -hmm. you know, Hickley. And, and again, I personally like them mixed with antique furniture. You know, I love Eve Kaplan, and, and also Andrea Coppell, who, who Jerry represents, makes these beautiful lamps uh, that look beautiful next to 18th century furniture. Right, right. Or even 20th century furniture. You can do an entire room of 20th century things that are beautiful, contemporary, vintage, just mix it all up and have beautiful art. Yeah. Well, now, you know, Alex had mentioned, Timothy, as a, you know, as a gallerist, can you, can you talk about the idea of art as a commodity? You know, is this a recent idea? And what is your view on, on sort of in looking at, at art as, as an investment kind of in a vacuum, I guess? 
art's always been a commodity. I mean, we only need to think of the Medici's and the importance they brought to art and then people wanting to own parts of their collection over history and the prestige that art connotes. Uh, today, we are hearing stories about, especially one of the surprising things is how con contemporary art, the values are going up. But in the big scheme of things, uh, it's only a rarefied group of artists that are participating in that. Most values increase slowly over time. And that's really what I encourage people to do. I mean, if you're going to get into art as an investment, you really have to be an insider. You really have to be connected. And I'm talking about a very rarefied world where you have a not, not very small fortune to spend because you're in a financial market. I think that the commodification, well, there goes an air conditioner, excuse me. <laughs> we're, anyway, good. we're good. I think the, the commodification of art, it definitely has benefits because at the end of the day, we want rare, beautiful things to mm -hmm. have value. And people are looking for alternative assets. But art is made to express uh, aesthetic prowess, new ideas, to push us, to get us to think. To, I was just out on the beach and it made me remember, uh, there's an artist by the name of David Levine. He probably died 10 years ago, but he's famous for his Coney Island watercolors. And I'm out on the beach and I'm looking at people on the beach and I see David's watercolors. He's, he showed me how to look at people on the beach differently. And that's what we want with art. And that's what we want. That's what I want people to take away from it. So over time is the best way uh, to build value. And I, I say, you know, art really should be and not just because I'm on a vacation, but art should be approached like a vacation. You know, you buy it, you enjoy it. And it's not you don't come home from a vacation and go, how much did my vacation go up in value like you would with, with a financial asset? <laughs> it's about enjoyment. And over time, you look back at it and you say, you know, that was a real bargain. So I, yeah. I think it, it, it cuts both ways. But in the end, if you want, the, like Alex said, the real joy comes from the aesthetic pleasure. Yeah, I love that. I, I think, feel like that's, that's an early takeaway here to approaching art like a vacation. And, and I can hear the cicadas in your, I mean, I know you're on vacation. So this is actually very, it's all coming together very well. Alex, can I say something to Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Know, something I just thought of, which is so interesting. When you go to somebody's house and they actually love their house and they love their interiors and they're enthusiastic about their home, it gives you such a different sense, even if it's not your taste, even if it's not your sensibility, it gives you such a, I don't know, there's something very special about it. When a house is personal and it feels loved, it yeah. feels. Yeah, I was writing that down because I felt like that's something I need to remember too. Um, just the feeling that you get when someone's enthusiastic about, about their own home, you know? I mean, there's nothing nicer for me, and, and really it's why I do what I do, is that second day when they've moved in and I get that call and it's just like, I don't know what to say how happy they are. Yeah, it's, it's like a big embrace. You know, kind of. They call and they're, you know, they're almost in tears and you know, the whole process, because there's so much that goes into the process from the construction to the architecture, mm -hmm. to the decoration, to the you know, the, the paintings and the trims and the furniture and the, you know, the, the, every detail that goes into it. And then when it all comes together and they're happy, it's just like, it makes you so joyful that yeah. people are actually living in these things every day and enjoying them and loving them. There's just nothing nicer in the world. Yeah, it's, it's like they know that it's a reflection of themselves. They know that, that, that you have achieved the reflection of, of themselves, you know? And beauty um, is such an yeah. important, you know, beauty soothes the soul. It really does. It makes you feel good to live in a beautiful interior. Yes, it's a great luxury, but it's also just, especially in the world we live in today where there's so much going on and, and, and we, we, we spend so much time in our houses now. It's, it's so important to care about that and, yeah. to, and to be surrounded by beauty. Yeah. Um, great point. And I think that goes back to, again, all of this wonderful art that was created during times when people really needed more beauty in their, their life. Um, now, Gerald, what are clients, you know, what do you see clients looking for today that is perhaps different than it was even five or 10 years ago? What is kind of, um, what is the demand like today in terms of what they're looking for? Basically, the designers I work with are looking for something that no one else has, uh, so they can present that to their client. But they're also, Alex being a case in point, uh, is willing to create with us something that no one else has for the client. Okay. 
got but that holds for the contemporary furniture but then for the antique uh, or the 18th century which we still do as well and also 20th century but those pieces have to be of a caliber that they are basically unique as well um, right the antique furniture we sell is all one of a kind you won't mm -hmm. find it in everyone else's house yeah yeah but so Mary, how about like when you take sort of an 18th century stone top and put it on a contemporary base well, that's where right. it's like you have something old and something new i love that too well, mm -hmm. that, that morphed out of the market about 10 or 15 years ago, as Alex brought up earlier, uh, when people were retreating like mad from the 18th century. The value wasn't there. Uh, there's one form, a uh, clothes press or a 18th century closet or Victorian armoire or whatever, but the wood used on those were superb. So we actually take those, since they can be bought for nothing, disassemble them and create contemporary pieces of furniture using old elements. And uh, in, in fact, we combine it mostly with steel. And as, yeah. again, as Alex mentioned, we have some beautiful veneered circular tops, rectangular tops or whatever, and those typically get steel bases. We've also taken uh, beautiful mahogany bases and added steel tops. So it's, it's all about reusing 18th century forms, which have become obsolete and not desirable and turning them into contemporary bits of furniture, which really are desirable and also one of a kind. Yeah. And, and full of style, you know, full of style, you know, totally unique and, and, and just, and also again, you know, green, you know, I tell this to people all the time to my young clients. I'm like, antiques are green. Do you realize that right. antiques are green and how great it is? And then to mix it with, with, with contemporary things, I just think it's so stylish and, and interesting yeah. and relevant and brings these antiques into the 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. The, the aluminum tables we made for Alex, the original tables we made in that form were made of steel. And uh, we started, it's, it's a form I've always liked, but we started doing those because say Chippendale chairs from 1750, 1760 were looking really, really old around a three pillar mahogany dining table. The whole thing looked like someone's grandmother's apartment. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking for vehicles to display 18th century chairs, and that's how we came up with that form. And then the uh, aluminum we did for Alec for... Uh, and then what about the incredible one you made for me for Athens with the bronze bases and the brass top and the faux porphyry and extending table that is really one of the most beautiful tables I've ever seen. And Jerry made it and I mixed it with, you know, gilded 19th century chairs and they look incredible together. It makes it all look current. It sounds like this creative lab that's going in where you're just kind of thinking of what, because it sounds like too, Gerald, you had said that that's one of the things that you enjoy the most is going in and looking at sort of a lot of furniture or, or whatever it is and saying, okay, but what can I do with that? Is that, that's sort of what you're doing a lot, a lot. It's, it's not only that. I mean, I, 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 I bought last week and just re received uh, uh, an 18th century chair. And it was at a little auction on Long Island, and I paid absolutely nothing for it. It looked absolutely awful. And this morning, I took all the um, upholstery off, got down to the 18th century upholstery, uh, or the 18th century sort of construction upholstery. And now you can see the contemporary form, the not contemporary form, you can see the 18th century form. And then we will take that and turn it into the 18th century chair it deserves to be. So it's not just remaking and using the components in this case we will bring that chair back to what it yeah it's it's restoring as well and in, in yeah. we will do it in such a way that when it's finished it will look like a contemporary form even though the chair probably dates from that time. okay yeah yeah um now timothy what are you seeing that your clients are looking for today what are they coming in that might have been different from five or ten years ago well, we've all seen so much now, you know, through Instagram and, and mm -hmm. the internet. Everyone wants uh, things that are forward looking, you know, I, it's lighter. I, there's a much greater uh, acceptance of abstract art, minimalism. Uh, also, I, I think we can't forget the fact that artists are being trained differently than they were 20, 30, 100 years ago. So artists are uh, being challenged to use new media. It's not just paint on canvas and, and people don't learn to draw like they once did. So this is this has really influenced the market and we're looking at, at things differently. Photography is big. Uh, 
that said, the market is broad, so it's hard to just say it's one thing or another, but overall, it's a lighter feel. I'm always encouraged, though, you know, like Alex was talking, I mean, uh, Gerald was talking about finding this chair. There's still clients that come in for what I call, I call European contemporary, and it's not really that, but it's people that really learned the craft of painting or drawing. They spend, I have an artist, she said she she learned to draw for six years. I mean, people, I mean, that's almost like becoming a, a, a physician, you know, just yeah. drawing. She said she drew six hours a day for six years learning to draw. And I think people, at the end of the day, people are more inclined to see what's unique. So even whether, whether it's a, a more traditional expression or a very contemporary expression, people want something that's that's unique, that takes yeah. an aesthetic leap. Yeah, yeah, which, which is right in line with what Gerald and, and Alex, you were saying the same. Alex, you approach it that way, your designs that way anyway, but you, the clients are coming to you. They want something that no one else has. Or I want them to have something no one else has too, because it's more interesting for me. Yeah. You know, it was funny, again, I, I was with a client this morning and she said to me, oh, well, have you ever done that before? I'm like, no, I do things I've never done before all the time. <laughs> That's part of what makes it unique. You don't want what I've done before. Yeah. You want something I've never done before. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to also talk, uh, get back a little bit to the mix of things because Gerald, you referenced, you know, when we talk about these contemporary pieces and in, in, in building into a balanced co collection, that was, you didn't always, you know, this helped shape your business. You were looking at how a well-balanced, well-decorated home, what would be in that? And it wasn't just antiques for you, right? And that kind of helped shape your business, correct? It, it morphed into that. I mean, I was very much a purist. I mean, I, uh, my education was from Sotheby's. I ran uh, uh, another gallery after that in New York and London selling only 18th century English furniture. So that's what I actually knew. The market changed 10 or 15 years ago and this 18th century furniture, again, as Alex pointed out, was no longer worth what it was worth. People stopped buying it wholesale. And, uh, but it was what I knew and what I did sell. So the first thing we did was a friend of mine, uh, Laura Armstrong, who's a contemporary artist and uh, did not have a gallery representing her. And the work was really clean, really contemporary. And that I would introduce over say a Chippendale commode and it made the Chippendale commode relevant. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden saleable as well. Uh, and by the same token, taking that commode and putting an old master picture above it or an 18th century landscape or whatever, which would have been very pleasing for a different market was just completely old fashioned and I couldn't sell it. So it did change the way we worked. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then also I handled a, a sale of Evangeline Bruce quite a few years ago as well. And there was a lot of really good 18th century furniture. A lot of it was from Nancy Lancaster, and it was really wonderful things, and not quite of the caliber I'd been selling, but I did a huge sale of that, and I was shocked at how well it sold. And in fact, there were plastic bits and pieces from Alessandro Albrizzi, and again, I would never have given that space at all in the shop, but again, people were clamoring for it, so that again brought a change in my market and my way of looking at things. It didn't have to be purely 18th century. It had to be good or it had to be interesting, you know, academically interesting as well. Uh, it had to have a, maybe an interesting social history. And uh, so that really did change the way I did business. Yeah. The way we're doing business now as well. And it sounds, and, and from my discussions with this panel, it sounds too like very reflective of how, of, of good decorating, that mix and that push pull of different eras and different artists. Um, but also that's what happens to you, you evolve. I mean, yeah. that's what a good deal or a good decorator, you evolve with changing times mm -hmm. and you adapt to it and, 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 and embrace it. Yeah. There, there's yeah. people selling early 18th century. I'm not quite sure how they make a living, uh, but, uh, and I, 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 I think it's interesting and I'm encouraged by the fact, but it doesn't interest me. I mean, I really want to sell wonderful things that I like. And then as you know, pointed out earlier, we sell primarily to designers and the designers are looking for things as well. In that case, we're doing a bit of editing. And- um, Okay, yeah. That's pretty much where the market is as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and, and Alex, going to you, when it comes to building a good collection, you encourage 
continuity. Um, some, and it's something that you go, goes back to how you, you started um, building your own collection. How do you begin and how, how, how loose or rigid are the threads that would make a, a person's collection? I'm talking about like one of your clients' collections. Well, I, I think it's, 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 a natural, it's a natural sort of progression of what happens. You know, you start in a direction and you evolve. And again, I think a good decorator helps to keep the client on track. You mm -hmm. know, that it, and, 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 and there's a lot of leeway, really. I mean, you can yeah. go in a lot of direction. I mean, in, in my own house, I guess, remember, you, you, we, we talked about it, I started with Orientalist painting. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of turned my color palette. And then as, as, as my career became important to me, it became Orientalist painting, interiors, and sort of things belonging to, you know, thanks to Jerry, thanks to Louis, thanks to Liz, things from great collections of great decorators or of tastemakers of the 20th century. So I wanted to own pieces that they own and incorporate that into my interiors. And again, you know, a bit of the grand tour of, you know, the travels to Europe and what you brought back or to the East or sort of the exoticism of things. And that worked with the Orientalist paintings and then contemporary pieces thrown in. And, and you can find that. So that was my personal experience, but clients' experiences are different and I encourage them to collect. You know, I have a, a, a wonderful client who's, you know, really purely a neoclassicist with, you know, contemporary art thrown in. And that's just what he does, it's what he likes, it's who he is. And then, you know, my niece and her husband who, whose townhouse I just finished, you know, she, he likes the White House and she likes Versailles. So yeah. between the two of them, you know, it's all about sort of formality and elegance and everywhere you look, it's very classic, but, yeah. but in, a, in a very European way with a sort of fresh American approach to it. You have a thread so there. I see. I can there see. There is it. a thread and, and yeah. the connection of, of the art and the decoration. You know, they love Paris, so there are French things in the house all over. And, and again, there, there are 20th century elements. There's a Serge Roche piece, you know, there's Lalanne. There's contemporary things thrown in to make it not feel stagnant. Yeah. But in general, she likes, they both like very classic interiors. So that's what's relevant to them. And then, you know, I have great clients who they're contemporary art collectors and they wanted nothing that wasn't 20th century in the house. Really? So, yeah. and that's fun too. So they're mm -hmm. all different and I like them all to be different and I encourage them to be individuals and to have their own aesthetic point of view that we create for them and yeah. work to, to collect. Yeah. Um, now, I, I wanna talk about this just because I wanna make sure that we get to it. And then, cause there's, you know, loads of other things too, is, is what is your advice? And I wanna hear from each of you, let's start with Alex since we're already here. What is your advice for educate? Cause I know this is so big for designers watching you, educating clients on um, sort of, I don't know if the right word is the investment of the art collection or building the good art collection that are maybe, you know, that maybe aren't seeing the relationship between that and the furnishings. What's your advice for education of clients? Well, look, I think that decorating is a great luxury. And I think the most important thing, and I always say right in the first meeting, this should be fun. Mm -hmm. This should be something that's a process that we work together. And they learn from me, I learn from them, we learn from dealers. So yeah. you, it's, it's all about learning. And I, I, I think it's very important that they, you know, you look at who they are and, and how they want to live and, and what, what are their choices and decisions that they make in order to create an interior that's relevant to them. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it, it, it's a road, it's a process. And I think by, by making it a pleasure for them, they start to love it. And, that you know, sounds like the key. He, yeah. he, he, didn't, he, he wasn't interested in the furniture. You know, they had this incredible apartment that was beautifully decorated that they inherited. They both lived in it and there was tons of beautiful things and they were just over it. And all they were interested in was contemporary art. And, and I said, you know what? Okay, so you're over this, but we're going to have to find something in the decorating world that's going to make you happy and excited. Well, he's like a junkie now. I mean, I'm like, okay, settle down, Sparky. You've got enough of that. We don't need more of that. You know, he 
loves it so much. He's like, Al, did you see this at this auction? Have you seen this? I'm like, we don't have a lick of room with one more piece of furniture. And, and he loves it all so much. So I think if you make it fun and you make it interesting and you go out together and you look, and again, I always say, no matter what your project and no matter what you're doing or your budget is, go to the best dealers all over the world, look at the best things, train your eye in a way so that you understand when you see something that actually is a bargain or a find, whether it's a painting or a piece of furniture. And look, shopping at auction today, I bid on everything, no matter what the price is, I'm on the phone all the time. And, and, and maybe it's something that's way out of budget. Sometimes I get it for a great price and, and sometimes I don't. But again, you also have to realize that if you miss out on something, you'll get something even better down the line. It's, yeah. you, you don't ever have to worry. Don't make yourself crazy. You know, decorating is not it's, it should be a pleasure, it should be a luxury, and you should have fun doing it. And there's always another beautiful thing around the corner. There's always more beautiful things coming up. And, 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 and you know, particularly living in New York, I mean, the auctions coming up now are crazy. I mean, it's the Aga Khan's brother, it's Jane Reitzman, it's Susan Goodfriend. I mean, it's, it's all these incredible collections that are coming and, and, and we're able to buy into so many beautiful things that are out there. Yeah. So enjoy it, make it fun, encourage your clients to do it, you know, give them books on, on, on interiors, let them, let them, you know, talk them through it, have lunch with them, have dinner with them, see how they like to live, understand what they want and create something that's beautiful and a pleasure and that they have ownership of. Because yeah. of the client ownership of their interiors, they really love it. Yeah. You really, can I say something here? No, yeah, Timothy, let's go to you. I think Alex is right. And one of the things that's very important is to introduce for art early in the process. I think a lot of times designers get to the end of a process that, you know, everyone's tired from the project, the budgets have been spent, and, and there's kind of maybe a push to get something on the wall. But it, I think uh, if you want to educate a client, you need to start it at the beginning hopefully, you know, introduce uh, the, the client to dealers, take them to dealers. I mean, I, I'm sure Gerald is like, I am, we want to do, we'll do the work for you. We have great respect for what the designer is doing. We're not here to take the project away from you. I know sometimes uh, art can make a really bold statement and designers are scared. It's, you know, perhaps going to mess up the, the project they've built. And, and that's not what we want to do. So get dealers involved in it. The other thing is it just takes a long time to, to, to educate a client. Mm -hmm. And that just has to be understood up front. And one thing you, I think it's very important to encourage clients to have an emotional response to something. And that way then uh, you can have a dialogue with them and you can say, okay, you like this, but it's not good for this reason, or we like it, but it won't fit that place in a room, but it, it opens a dialogue. The other thing about introducing art early in the process is when you, they won't have sticker shock because good art is expensive. I mean, it, it's just the reality of it. It's very hard to get a bargain. Sometimes you will. But, you know, you don't want people to have sticker shock and then just retrench. So getting them engaged early on is very important. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. Gerald? Well, the, there were two reasons I got involved in, in selling contemporary art. And I discussed the first one earlier in that it was making the antique stuff look relevant. The other one was I found over and over again that uh, designers and decorators were were finishing projects and the client had no contemporary art. Uh, that's to reference Tim's point. And uh, they were looking for things to buy that weren't academically challenging or, or economically threatening to present to their clients. And so we have a lovely roster of contemporary artists who fit both of those bills and those things shown within the context of either the contemporary furniture or the contemporary uh, or the uh, antique furniture that we sell, again, allows for the designer to show the client and finish the project with interesting and acceptable things rather than having the client after the project is finished 10 years down the road and buying hideous things. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Go that, ahead. Was, that was the other reason we got involved in selling contemporary art. It's, yeah. it's well, you, you, you see it in Europe all the time, Jerry, which you really don't see in America as much. And, and that's the other thing I like so much about Jerry, because he has a very, 
He's very American, but he also has that European knowledge and understanding. You'd go to great antique dealers in London and they'd have contemporary paintings mixed in that they sold of artists or just, just to show it properly, that it makes it all feel fresh. It doesn't make it feel exactly huh. as Jerry was saying, like your grandmother's house. Yeah. I think another thing too is a lot of time designers, uh, it's frustrating to try to educate someone when they don't know anything. So, uh, and, you know, realistically, they may not make a lot of money on selling a painting. So there's less incentive to do so. But I'm sure Alex will tell you that art makes a project. It takes it to another level. And then it gives totally. you a, a heads it above other designers. Finish. Right. It, I mean, it, you need all the components to come together to make a well-rounded, relevant interior that feels like home. And it expands. Art is a very make, important part right, of it. Right, right. And yeah. it expands your reputation as a designer when you do that, even if you don't make as much money on it and it takes a lot more effort. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I mean, it, not, everything is not about money. I mean, sure. there's also, you know, people need to remember that. It's just not all about money. I mean, money's great. But you also, it's your name, it's your reputation, and it's also the satisfaction that your clients have and living in their homes and, and feel good about them. They need to be finished. Yeah. Accessories, furniture, art, everything. It needs to come together. You know, I, I find in New York, I have a little bit the opposite where I've got to convince them about the furniture. They've already, they're already interested in the art. You know, I find I I've, I've got to sell them on the 18th century sometimes and saying the importance of mixing those things in to give the house gravita and sort of a sense of history, which mm -hmm. is so important. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it actually goes to my next thought, which is, you know, something that is so intrinsic to the three of you, just even one conversation, you know that relationships are at the core. Like you said, money's not everything, but relationships actually are. And, you know, to Gerald's point about that second reason he got into the business is, these designers were able to have a relationship with him and know who to go to that can provide that part of it that, you know, for, um, for whatever they need to do with their budget or, or their style, that kind of thing. But knowing who those, having those relationships to say, here's what we need and here's what we're kind of looking for. And I think, um, you know, just knowing your relationship with Gerald and your relationship and, and Timothy had been talking about, you know, um, those those connections will actually really add to add to any project is having those deep connections and knowing to, who to go to. Would you agree? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and in, in our case, I, mean, I feel like we're accommodators sometimes more than anything else. Alex or another. Well, I would I would say that Jerry. I don't think you're an accommodator. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no. really. He's, you, you know, he's so underrated. You, you, will, you will walk in and say, have a you... a lot more than an accommodator. Trust. You will walk in and say, have you done this before? And and say, no. <laughs> you will walk in and say, have you done this before? And I'll say, no. And uh, it's usually a um, sort of development on something we've already done. And it takes us and uh, our artisans or our artists to another level and into a different form. And it's absolutely wonderful. And so we, we progress that way from working with designers who ask us to do something which we've not done before, nor have they done before. And feel comfortable knowing that that's something that you would thrive on, you know? It's, it's great. We have wonderful people and uh, they're all thrilled as well. Yeah, yeah. Very, it's, I think that's, that's a very interesting aspect of it. Um, and, you know, uh, Timothy, you, you had, Hey, you had said something, you know, similar, which is that, you know, having, just having those people that know that you, they can come to you and just ask you questions. And so I would say to designers, deepening those relationships, those go to pick up the phone, knowing that even if they don't have what you're looking for, right, they know what you're looking for, kind of, right? Well, I think, I think designers want us to push them at the same time. We, I mean, we do need to be accommodating, but we also, they, they want to be inspired. They, you know, mm -hmm. they want us to help them exceed their clients' expectations. So in that regard, I, I'm sure, you know, we're not just catering to taste, but we understand their taste and we want to take it to another level because that's what aesthetic um, development is about. And at the I mean, that's what we're all doing, Timothy. We're all encouraging and and, and trying to, to better ourselves and, and on our clients and learn from each other. And it's a whole process of, of synergy of all working together to create places that are different. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I, I wanted to ask, this is a bit of an open-ended question, because um, I'm looking at my, my list of, by the way, to all of those watching, after I talked, we had one talk with, you know, all four of us, I had 11 pages of notes. I mean, I was like, just furiously, there was, again, everything is an education, um, especially with, um, with this group. Um, so I'm going to ask kind of an open-ended question of what's most exciting, what's most fascinating to you in the art world today, or what part of it is, is most fascinating to you today? And anyone can pick it up. Well, I think maybe rather than fascinating, challenging would be mm -hmm. a, an interesting approach. Uh, we do exhibitions three or four times a year. We have large book launches. And none of that will be possible right now. And yeah. I, know, I know major galleries are doing um, exhibitions without having actual people there. And so we're toying with that as well. And I, I, I'm actually looking forward to two exhibitions that we'll be mounting in the next few months. I haven't quite figured out how to do it, uh, but there's no reason not to. We have the new work by the artist. We want to show it and uh, we won't have three or 400 people coming for cocktails, but we will be able to show it to probably even a larger group once we've figured out how to do that. But um, so that's the interesting part of the market to me right now, but the rest of it, you know, we deal with um, not a huge handful of designers, but a very important group of designers and we businesses remain very, very steady because of that. Yeah, yeah, good. Anybody else on that? For me, it's just, people that understand how to reinvent beauty because I think the all three of us you know we love beauty and and it's just artists that can take that to another level I, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite simple um, I kind of cut my teeth on 19th century art impressionism and then I worked myself way back and it's been very interesting for me to really engage in what's happening in the contemporary art world because that's um, it's, it's, it's cutting edge and it's, it's very exciting to see what artists are doing with new media and, you know, around political expression or around the climate or just making a statement about who they are. I, it's, it's very exciting to see how we're all looking forward without letting go of the past. Yeah. And to both of your points, it's exciting to, to me and probably to those out there is just is figuring out how we're going to get to access this when maybe times aren't as normal because everyone's pivoting and I feel like we will be able to access this, you know, the new artists, the exhibitions, that kind of thing, because everyone's been so just limber about it, I guess. Yeah. I want to say one thing I think is so important for designers, for collectors, for clients, go to the museums. I mean, they, that's where you're going to educate your eye. I mean, I'm talking about everything from the Met to the Broad in Los Angeles. Go to museums. They, they're, you find something you love, and your eye catches a hold of it, and then your eye develops along its own natural progression. And I think that's what we all want is clients who, 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 who catch hold of something and then follow it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, I totally agree with you, Timothy. I think that really my whole basis for love of history was from my childhood and being taken to museums and great houses and traveling and seeing the world and falling in love with it. And, and, and again, training my eye by going to the best dealers and seeing the best things, the best painting, the best furniture. And then it, it, it teaches you about quality and, and what you love and what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it's just personally, France just did it for me. I mean, you know, I'm just such really, I'm, I'm, I'm a total Francophile. I mean, I just, I, I can't tell you how I feel about French interiors and, and French decoration. And, and I love that. And I would never have known that if I hadn't been to Paris and I hadn't seen it and I haven't traveled. So, yeah. you know, that's where, you know, privilege comes in handy and is very relevant. That, that exposure is so important and that we're blessed to be exposed is, is really a gift. And it's an important thing because it teaches you about what you love. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are, let's see, um, if there are any questions, we'll, we'll start that. But I do have one more question from you all. And it's a very, <laughs> something I came across, I didn't even tell you guys about this. As I was preparing for this, um, 
Each of you started your business in 1987. Wow. Is that true? All of us? Hmm. I and, did. And I th I, and that's what it said in your bios. I, guess. And I, I, thought, I, thought I started this one. That, that's when you started this one. And then, Timothy, you, you opened your gallery in 89, but started the business in 87. Right. And then, Alex, you started your business in 87. So I guess my question is, can you all look for a piece of art for me from 87? <laughs> I think 87 might be that year. That's like some magical oh year. Funny. Oh, what? That's kismet, right? That's interesting. Well, I thought I got it confused. I was looking at notes and I thought, well, who was it? Which one was it? And it was all three of you. <laughs> that's crazy. I mean, that's really, that, that's incredible. Yeah, what? there must have been some magic. Yeah, there must have been some magic to that. Yeah. Um, We're a truffle. Oh, what is yeah. a truffle? I'm sorry, a truffle. <laughs> you Did you say the politician? Yeah, that's a <laughs> truffle. Yeah. Um, okay, I can probably if they we still have a few more minutes, and I'm not seeing any questions, so um, I'm going to ask from some of the ones that I kind of skipped over to make sure that we kept we kept going. Um, how do you feed your own curiosity, um, sort of in your off hours, kind of? I look, I look, I, I look. That's really the bottom line. There's so much to see on the internet these days, of course, Instagram, but I yeah. think for all of us, it is looking and reading as well. Yeah. And yeah. those auctions that are coming up with yeah, that's what I'm seeing. all of those close ups of those great interiors and everything in there and all of those details. And, you know, I'm so inspired by that. You know, there, there's, a, there's a chair in the Reitzman sale that the way, the, the, just an upholstered chair and the way. I guess Henri Samuel or whoever did that chair for her, the way it's tied and the details on it. I mean, it's just crazy. It's, you just love it. And it's so, it's unique and it's different and it's inspiring. Yeah. You know, maybe it's a little dated, but you could bring it we get to, to being more current. And so I'm, I'm very inspired by, by the things coming up and the sales coming up of, of, of really great collections. Yeah. It's also really nice to hear these guys talk because they love beauty. And, you know, that conversation around beauty is always inspiring. Yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of um, just in the different conversations that I'm having, whether I'm working on a story that was already planned before this or uh, meaning the, the past few months, um, that I feel like the relationships even between client and decorator have been deepened and client and uh, and dealer have been deepened because there's there's it's almost like we've slowed down and so there's more um i it's it from what i've heard some of the clients are sometimes more involved now and and asking more questions um they're wanting to see and spend time with their eye a little bit more than they would have had time to before or they're in their house and or they're in their house more and they're basically saying, okay, I've just been living with this. You know, now it's time to make it that thing that like, like Alex, you were saying, that's just this pure joy, you know, of reflection of them, so. Well, it's, a, it's again, as I always say, you know, it's a great luxury and, and, and it, it's, it's an incredible thing to live in, in beautiful interiors that you love and that feel personal. It really is, especially in, 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 in difficult times because you feel very safe yeah. and, and you feel, you know, you feel safe and comfortable. And, and, you know, those of us who feel that way, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a great luxury and we really are so thankful to have that. And, and it's so important. And there are so many people who don't have that, you know, your heart just goes out in these difficult times that, yeah. yeah. you know, it's tough. It's tough for a lot of people and we're just really, really lucky. And we're lucky to be in a business where, I think we are looking at beautiful things and, and dealing with beauty. And it's not that our businesses aren't tough sometimes too. Any business is tough, mm -hmm. but, but it's such a fun business because you're talking to creative people and you're encouraging people to, to, to find their sensibility. And it's just, it's really nice. It's, it's, I, I, I looked at a lot of businesses and I found that the decorating business was really the nicest of any business that I could find because of, the people you deal with because of the, the clients, because of the relationships you create. And, and it, it really is, it's a wonderful, wonderful business. And I feel so lucky to do what I do and, and to have this business, yeah, in difficult times. And it is 
one of the businesses that actually is still doing well, which again, we're all really lucky for that. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Like, you know, absolutely. I, there are a lot of businesses I'm glad I'm not in right now. Right. Um, and my heart goes out to those businesses and I worry about New York and I worry about the city and I worry about the world and the country. But, but again, there's a wonderful safety in, in beautiful interiors and it makes you feel really good and happy. And it makes you, you know, think of how you can help other people. When you feel safe, it's easy to help others. You know, I, I, I'm involved in charities and, and, and I come up with great ideas during COVID of, of, of how to make money for charities in new ways and to do things because we've had that time and we should always use bad times to do good things, I think. It's very important that we are always, you know, trying to better our lives and to learn more. I find sometimes with books, you know, I'm so excited to find a book that I haven't seen, but, you know, I feel like I've seen so many books and I'm, I, I know so much, of, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen so much. I'm always looking for things I haven't seen and new things that are interesting to me and exhibits. And I think you can be stimulated, you know, creatively by a ballet, by an opera, by, mm -hmm. by a museum exhibit, by somebody's house that you go to. There are so many ways to be you know, to think of new things and come up with new ideas. But it's important to be with people who are creative and who can help you better yourself. Yeah. And I have to believe that, and I, and I think this is going back full circle to what we talked, and as we wrap this up, is that there are so many artists right now hard at work finding beauty and creating beauty <clears throat> in challenging times. And we're going to see um, the results of that as more of this, the, as we start to see this art as we come out of this. So. And we're, you know, we would go to people like Gerald and Timothy who would be able to find those people and bring them right. together, show them to us. Right, right, right. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you all so much. I think we've reached, it is, it is now, well, it is, it is two o'clock my time. I'm on central time. But um, I want to thank you all so much for being here. Um, I've learned a lot as, as like double the amount from our first discussion. So this has just been so wonderful to talk with each of you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Alan. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Adak. Thank you. Absolutely. Now we're going to, um, I'm just going to go back and share my screen here and we are going to, um, just give me a moment. We're going to go back. We've got this beautiful, um, we're on, we're on Timothy's artwork here. Um, we're going over to, we're gonna show you some editor's picks. Like I said, the showrooms are open and um, I wanted to show you from our sponsor, Made Goods, their new collection is out. And I firmly believe, I, we we're talking about some of their new pieces. And just as an example of some of the new things that are out, I, I'm a, a firm believer that you need something woven in every room, you need something natural in every room. And so they have this wonderful caning collection that I think is, is so chic with sort of like that, um, that almost that open weave back, backdrop. And then also another thing in our conversations at work, we've been talking about beautiful curves in a lot of the new um, furnishings that we're seeing. So I really thought this, this, um, this mirror um, made from this mango wood was really neat because we always are looking at very at quality woods and very interesting woods as well, talking about the quality of materials. And so um, yeah, we just wanted to remind everybody that Made Goods is open, that all the showrooms are open, and they've got all their new stuff. And so that's something that we can still do. So um, be sure and stop by and visit them all and say hello. Have some great conversations. So thank you again, everybody. That does it for State of the Arts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hey. Are we off? <laughs>